Photography Daily. Could you talk to more fine art photographers, you asked? What a perfect idea, I replied. Let's hear more from photographers that really get out into the wild, you said, like seascape photographers. Great, I agreed. So here's someone with a story I know you'll enjoy. Jonathan Critchley, widely observed to be one of the world's most in-demand in his genre fine art photographers. Who better then to answer the million-dollar question, fine art photography, what is it? You know, somehow I knew you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those huge questions, and, and yeah. I'm not quite sure there's an accurate answer because it, it, whoever you ask, you seem to, to get a different answer. Jonathan's a photographer who believes that having a strong interest in what you photograph is the key to creative excellence. The sea became a place that I would go, and, and without having to say anything, I felt like I was being understood mm. and uh, made me feel fairly insignificant and small and in that way made me realize that my problems were insignificant and small compared to other things that were going on and that's really a sense of what I still feel now when I'm in the sea or by the sea or on the sea or whatever I feel that I'm part of something huge but a very tiny tiny small part of something very huge. We talk about why he has such a passion for the oceans. It was a rough day winter I guess and uh, the waves were rolling in and there was this foam on top of the waves so I said to one of my parents what's that and my dad I think said oh we call that the white horses. Yeah. Uh, and instantly, you know, and the, the imagination of a small boy turned these foamy waves into these horses that were galloping in from the sea. Leaving his nine to five, Jonathan Critchley took some calculated risks, as you'll find out. But he was very determined in terms of what he wanted and what he didn't. The first thing was that I was never going to work for anybody else again as long as I lived. That yeah. was it. I'm going to be my own boss and the, and the, the mistakes that I make will be my mistakes and, and the good times will be the good times that, that I've created. Today is in many places, I think, a masterclass in self-belief. And so I really constructed things using the knowledge that I developed over a few years of working with a brand. I thought, well, I'm going to treat myself like a, like a brand. We also talk about another side of his work most definitely on land. I knew nothing about horses whatsoever. I, I, I knew pretty much roughly what end was which, but apart from that, I didn't really know much about them. We learn about the pictures he makes where his subjects seemingly have him right in their sights. It's, you know, horses, when they're running at you, uh, the last thing in the world they want to do is to hit you. Jonathan's work is renowned around the world, but there's always someone to make sure you keep grounded. I met this person and they were saying that their mother had seen my work and their mother, who, who was fairly elderly at the time, said, oh yes, he's the chap that takes very beautiful pictures of absolutely nothing. From white horses to wild horses, the job of dreams. Stories of life told by photographers. And today that photographer is fine art photographer Jonathan Critchley. Today's show is kindly supported by the new patrons of this title, Thank You, where this week you'll start to see those behind-the-scenes articles. And, of course, mpb.com, the number one platform for buying, selling and trading used gear in the States and Europe. So what happens if you decide to sell gear to make some extra money from kit you just don't use anymore? Well, you go to MPB, hit the Sell button, enter the details of the kit get an instant quote, and then, if all is good, those nice people at MPB send a courier to collect your boxed-up kit. It arrives at the warehouse, you get it checked in. If all the descriptions and quality adds up, then you get paid. Same day as arrival. An MPB carefully monitors supply and demand to ensure that sellers receive the highest price possible and that all items are priced correctly for the market because they're not interested in only dealing with you once. No, they'd love to be there for you next time. And the time after that, go to mpb.com. Strong week of guests ahead in a moment, Jonathan Critchley. Tomorrow, in the new Snapshot Tuesday edition, Stefan Russo on being the photographer in parliamentary grounds on the day that 2017 terror attack happened before his lens. Wednesday, Daniel Hughes from Special Forces to world-class cyclist to adventurist photographer. Thursday, there's a snapshot edition on handling rejection, learning to love the word no, or at least embrace it. And of course, we end the week on Friday with another of our photo walks. Let me share my romantic notion of owning a cottage by the coast. I kind of have two versions of, really. It's, it's either a fisherman's hut perhaps practically on but certainly close to a harbour wall or or perhaps more me, a centuries-old lookout high up on the coastal path. A clear view out to sea, softly woken each morning by chattering gulls, dancing on the turbulent eddies as they 
rise above the sheer cliff drops and serenaded by the soft echoes of tidal breakers in the cove down below each evening as the sun falls. Sounds perfect. Well, here's a photographer who's discovered the serenity of the sea, being by water, on water, even in water. His trademark black and white square format pictures of the sea, sailing and more latterly horses, has won him much admiration worldwide. His photographs hang around the globe, and his client list includes Ralph Lauren, Saatchi and Saatchi, and Vogue. Highly aspirational titles and markets for a photographer who's built his reputation from scratch during a period of finite finances for his plans to come together. This is Jonathan Critchley's story. Can I just say that uh, rarely, uh, Jonathan, have I seen diptychs on a homepage that are as well curated as that of your own. A, a flapping cell, an arctic shelf with mirroring ridges and a horse's mane, perfectly mirrored again by, by what looks like the folds on. I don't know if it's a head or a main cell, but I know it's a cell. I, <laughs> I, I felt like I'd entered a physical gallery. Was was that your intention? Well, f- firstly, thank you very much, uh, Neil, for noticing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, completely my intention. Uh, I think, uh, for me anyway, my website is really... I like to sort of present that gallery feel and uh, I like my website to be a sort of quiet place where you can potter through a few images and uh, at, at your leisure and really see them see them how I like them to be seen. So that's sometimes in mismatched pairs as you, as you picked up on. So I don't necessarily feel that um, a sale print should be hanging next to a sale print. I think sometimes they work um, in, with different uh, different subject matter either side. Mm. And so that's what you're picking up on. So. Yeah, so, well, it works. It definitely does. Um, I, I want to tackle three words, fine art and photography. <laughs> words that I see used so frequently to describe work that's good, but not necessarily fine. You're one of the world's leading fine art photographers. So I want to know from you, what defines fine art photography? What makes a picture that and not just a, a well-presented image? You know, somehow I knew you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those huge questions. And, and yeah. I'm not quite sure there's an accurate answer because it, it, whoever you ask, you seem to, to get a different answer. Um, to me, and I can only give you my opinion, and and some will say it's wrong, and some people will you know will disagree. But for me, um, I like my work to be my representation or, of something I'm looking at. So uh, not necessarily a, a, a reality thing, something that just looks a bit different. Uh, it's my take on whatever I'm shooting, and it's it's a product, if for, for one of a useful, horrible world, that will end up hopefully on someone's wall. That's you know that's where it, that's where it ends up. Um, so in the same way as a, as, a, as, a, as a fine art painter would want their end product, their, their their work to end up on a wall. That's how I see things. It's that's what it's for. It's not for meant necessarily for advertising purposes or for uh you know for travel magazines it's basically meant for it's it's a print so it's meant to go on the wall and that's really how i how i look at it so so does that include right down to the medium of what it's printed on and, and the, the inks that are perhaps used or, or maybe it's not that technical i don't know well i think it, for me it is but i think for many people it isn't it's just it's it's really um yes you can look at the materials but it's for me it's it's really ha- how you it's really what you're portraying and how you're portraying it rather than what you're portraying it on, perhaps. There, there are a few words that I use so regularly in my conversations with photographers. If, if our chat, Jonathan, were a drinking game, you would you would not want the word graft. Because here it comes again. Your, your work graces the pages and campaigns for a real raft of big and aspirational clients. Ralph Lauren, Ritz-Carlton, Vogue mm. magazine. But I know it didn't start like that. How how did it begin? Because it has to have been sheer graft, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's a good word, uh, graft. Um, it, I, it, yes, it was hard work, but um, but enjoyable. Um, it, it started. I mean, I'll, I'm not going to go. I'll, I'll give I'll give you a potted history, Neil, rather than. Well, I like full, I, I like a full history. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I came late to being a professional photographer, although I'd studied photography early on in my years. Um, I, I realized I knew how to take a picture, but I didn't really know how to make money from it. I think that's the, yeah. that's the problem that many photographers face, uh, especially nowadays when there are so many people uh, wanting to be photographers. Uh, at the time, I I'd, um, I'd picked up some... My father used to hand me his old cameras, and uh, I used to have... I, like so many people I've spoken to since, uh, it seems to be their fathers or one of their parents that's, or grandparents yeah. that yeah. starts them off on this journey. Yeah. And for me, that was certainly the case. I used to get um, handed my father's old cameras when, when I was a very small boy, and although they had no film in, uh, I used to 
constantly having my eye pressed uh, in the back of the camera and wanted to see how life looked, you know, that way. Uh, it, it went on. I, uh, when I left home and sort of became a young man, I still had this vision, this dream. I wanted to be an artist of some sort. Uh, I, at one point, I thought I was going to go into charcoals or, or something like that. But um, I remembered the camera and had a friend who was a professional photographer. So he gave me a few tips in the dark room, got into it that way, and soon was um, taking my own photographs. But th at that point, it was black and white pictures of models uh, working for model agencies. So I was basically employed by some agencies. Um, to to uh, for for new kind of new models who were coming in without a portfolio basically i was i was able to take outdoor pictures of them on the coast on the beach all in black and white it's always been black and white and that sort of led to other things and i was doing okay but i just realized that there wasn't um i just didn't know how to convert what i really wanted to do into earning money and uh Whilst I was doing this, I got offered uh, a marketing post uh, with uh, a water sports company, which was the reason I ended up in France, which is where I'm speaking to you now. I, yeah, I live in southwest. You, you were a brand manager for them, a brand director, no less, actually, weren't you? Yeah, it started off sort of marketing and went into that, absolutely. And then um, my wife, uh, I, I was getting really fed up with, uh, with the whole internal politics of working with a large brand. And um, really wanted to have my notice in, uh, had the conversation with my, my wife and she said, well, okay, that's fair enough. But one thing I should tell you uh, is that I'm pregnant. Right. Uh, so on the same day, really, I found out that we were <laughs> going to have a, a start a family and I realized I just couldn't, I didn't want my kids to be, it was kids, it was twins. Uh, we found out, um, to be born with me working in a situation that I was unhappy with. So I went back to photography and, um, and this time I had lots of marketing and business experience behind me. So I was able to, fortunately for, for us as a family, able to make it work. Mm -hmm. But uh, the C has been uh, the, the overriding sort of link between everything I do. And that, that, that came first as the passion, really. The, the, uh, the, the photography came after. Uh, and I still don't really see myself as a passionate photographer. I see myself as a passionate, passionate about what I'm shooting. Wow. And I think that's uh, that's always been something I've tried to to put across. Uh, is that it's you know if you're shooting something you love, uh, then really photography is a, is the secondary part of, of what you do. Uh, it's it's being in that situation in that moment in front of something you adore. That's that's the that's the bonus part for me. That's the wonderful thing. So yes, it's been a graft, but it's been a graft. Um, yeah, doing something I love. I've never thought of it that way, actually. That you that if you if you are absolutely passionate about something and we're going to talk about the sailing and we're going to talk about the horses that mm. actually the camera is the conduit really isn't it it's, it's not it's not the be all and end all well that's certainly how i've always seen it i think other people i I've, I've no photographers who are very passionate about taking a picture and that's what they live for is actually being out and taking a picture that's certainly not the case with me if I don't pick up a camera for six months, I'm absolutely fine with that. Uh, it doesn't bother me. I have enough photographs now. Luckily, I've been doing it a long time that you know I can exist for for, for a few months without actually taking another picture. But uh, yes, for me, that's certainly the case. But I can't really exist um, very easily or very happily without being in front of the things that I love. You know, the, the, the sea and the horses and everything. That's part of what I what's a part of me really. So you found yourself more as a, a curator during that period than a photographer. Yeah, I think I am really. I, I think I, I am more of a curator, curator than, than a photographer right. in many ways. I, yeah. It's uh, that's what I. That's a role that I really love. And yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it was very beneficial. I know that it's been a horrible time for so many people, but mm. at the same time, I think I've always been a very positive person and, and like to look on what we can get out of a bad situation that, that will be beneficial. And that certainly was something for me that, that worked. I'd just like to go back to, to when you started your your business. Then, so I mean, you took a, a big leap of faith because um, you, you had the twins on the way. Mm. Um, you had stepped out of uh, the words brand and director together sound to me like that it's a pretty good way to earn a living um, and and then there we are uh, as a photographer yes for sure with some real marketing knowledge behind you now but it's still a leap of faith how, how did you how did you start the business and what was the business when you began well I didn't know it all I knew is that I wanted to to make a living out of um, out of making art, you know, making making yeah. work that will go on people's walls. That was really what I wanted to do. Uh, and I, then there were certain stipulations I was making to myself um, based on my bad experiences in working for, for big companies. The first thing was that I was never going to work for anybody else again as long as I lived. That yeah. was it. I'm going to be my own boss and the, and the, the mistakes that I make will be my mistakes and, and the good times will be the good times that, that I've created. It was really, it was really that, uh, you know, myself and my family. So uh, that was the first stipulation. The second thing was that I was going to be entirely honest and faithful to, to the sort of work I wanted to do and I wasn't going to diversify in any way. Uh, that I would completely follow my heart and uh, not listen 
listen to anybody else in terms of you should be shooting this or we could sell a few of those. Can you do that? It was really I wanted to just listen to myself and um, and and follow that. Uh, I think this comes from having a, uh, my wife calls it unshattering confidence um, from my childhood. <laughs> I was very lucky to have a wonderful childhood, which yeah. which gave me a lot of confidence um, in my own abilities and yeah, and my own feelings. I think in many ways. So I think that was a huge, you know, a huge benefit to me. Well, being being yeah. principled, of course, is is all very well, but if you've you've got to make the pennies come in to start with. I know starting up my own photography business, I don't think I was half as principled as you. Not even, not even a fraction. I'm sure. No, I, I don't know where it came from, Neil. I, I think you know, looking back, it, it's. Um, I didn't even know how I was going to do it at the start. I, I, I didn't know quite which route I was going to take. Um, uh, we we remortgaged the house uh, at the time to give ourselves enough income or money to live for a year and a half without earning anything. So right. I, I'd sort of you know, that that obviously helped and took some of the pressure off. And then I looked at different ways that I, I was going to make it work. How was I going to take pictures of the black and white pictures of the sea and make it work? And of course, the print market was one thing, but I realized I needed some sort of reputation. Yeah. Yeah. And so I really constructed things using the knowledge that I developed uh, over a few years of working with a brand. I thought, well, I'm going to treat myself like a, like yeah. a brand. And in the same way that you, uh, you know, you don't go to Coca-Cola for jeans, I realized that I would have to specialize in what I did and, and, and become the go-to guy for a mm. certain style of work and, mm. you know, get over that, uh, that sort of slight nervousness that British uh, men have about speaking about themselves and, uh, and just really push. What is it about the, the sea, Jonathan? I know, I know that you moved to Limington as a, as a, as a young lad, and obviously mm. that, that put you instantly in close connection with it. But laying aside the photography for a moment, what, what, what do you feel when you're, you're out there, among it, in it? It's, um, we moved to Limington when I was uh, about 14, and the reason we moved there is because, sadly, my father died uh, the year before. And uh, we, my mother, uh, my older sister, my older sisters had already left home. Um, and so it was just myself and my mother. And, she's, and she, for one reason or another, decided we were going to move down to the south coast uh, from just outside London, where I grew up. Uh, moving to Limington, of course, I'd already been always been around the sea when I was a child on holiday. And I'd always been the last, you know, the first one into the sea and the last one out of the <laughs> sea when it, on, on those times. Yeah. I'm, so many, show, I'm sure so many yeah. kids are. Yeah. Um, but it, I think what happened happened when we moved down to Limington. For those that don't know, Limington is a small town on the south coast of England, which is very renowned for its yeah. sailing. It's in Hampshire. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely little spot, beautiful town. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah. Um, have you been? Yes, I have, yes. I, I, yeah, I, I photographed a, there, but but not, not the sea. You? No, I photographed an event there. <laughs> but, okay, uh, yeah, well, it's, yeah. It's, it is a very, a very beautiful spot. It is, yeah. Um, and, you know, having had this tragedy in my life, I think uh, I would find myself going for long walks uh, during during the school holidays and end up right by the sea and would be sitting on this little bench uh, for hours just watching the sea. Uh, there were no mobile phones then. There was no, you know, there was no other source of, inf- you know, in- entertainment for, for me sitting on the bench. It was just the sea to look at. And the sea became a place for consolation. It came, became a place that I would go and, and without having to say anything, I felt like I was being understood. Mm. And... Uh, made me feel fairly insignificant and small and in that way made me realize that my problems were insignificant and small compared to other things that were going on and that's really a sense of what I still feel now when I'm in the sea or by the sea or on the sea or whatever I feel that I'm part of something huge but a very tiny tiny small part of something very huge and I I like that feeling you know it it, it sort of grounds us all I think. And And then being out at sea as well sailing I would imagine that's a very different emotion. It's just heaven. I, I adore being on the sea. And, mm. you know, now I have a, my, my, my children now are uh, 14 and a half. Uh, and we recently just came back just before lockdown. We were down on the Mediterranean coast. And uh, I, as always, I wanted to rent a boat uh, for half a day. And, and I would quite happily stay on the water um, for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and not, not think about it and be happy. They, of course, being much more normal than I am, after three hours said, <laughs> shall we head back now and get some lunch? Well, let's turn uh, for a moment to a kit of a different kind, not what you're, you're using to be out there on the water or, or walking, but, but what, what you're using to photograph what's out there. I would imagine what's in the kit bag for you needs to be pretty hardy. I, well, I use um, whichever happens to be the latest Nikon camera. I've been a Nikon um, chap, um, you know, not in any way sponsored by them, by any way, mm. by, by the way. It's just a personal choice. 
uh, since I, I bought my first sort of grown-up camera when I was about 18, which I saved up for, which was a really old Nikon FM um, oh, with, God, a, yeah, with, a, with yeah. a battery pack at the yes, bottom, you know, with, yeah. the, with the motor drive. And uh, I, I loved that camera. I just, I, and, and then it came about because I'd read a Wilbur Smith book, and in it, the protagonist was using uh, a, a Nikon camera, and it was, it, <laughs> at one point, I think, used it to cave in the head of someone. And, and I thought, this thing must be, <laughs> must be really sort of yeah. strong. And, and I, li- I liked the sort of, sort of thought of that. So I, I bought a Nikon, and I've, I've, I've used them since then. So whichever Nikon camera is around, I normally have three of them. Um, I, I like the bigger body cameras. So at the moment, I'm using uh, the D850s uh, with, with the battery pack. So it's, wow. so it's a bigger camera, a big, heavy thing. And uh, I love that. I don't like... Um, I've never been tempted to use mirrorless uh, in any way. I just wouldn't feel right. It would feel wrong in my hands. Um, I'm quite a big guy. I'm six foot two and, yeah. and sort of have, as my wife calls them, sausage fingers. And uh, I, yeah, the thought of having little buttons fr- would frustrate me. Do you put them in housing to, to keep the spray away from them? No, I, I, I know I should, but I, I don't. Um, I just let it happen and then I just clean them afterwards. Yeah. Uh, I often take an assistant with me just really to mop off the front of a lens because, uh, yes, you, you, can, you obviously get a lot of spray and, and that sort of stuff. I'm normally using all three at the same time and someone's passing me. Mm. Or if I'm my own, I'll just do it, simply do it myself. I would imagine um, if uh, a Jonathan Critchley assistant, I, I can imagine the, um, the, si- the six by one advert in the newspaper will say something like, must have good sea legs. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. They uh, they have to put up with a lot, but yes. um, no, we have good fun though. Yeah, I mean, it's sure. not a bad yeah. life, is it? Um, your images are beautifully composed. Um, I already said that when we started speaking. I mean, the, the words that have been used to associate your your work, and I would use them as well: simple, calm, actually meditative is one I, I added. Um, and that, that latter word w- would that describe how you work? Do you think in your presentation in this this environment? Um, well, thank you. Yeah, in fact, the nicest thing I've ever heard um, anyone say about my work is it was it was um, the, apparently I, I met this person and they were saying that their mother had seen my work and their mother who who was fairly elderly at the time said, "Oh yes, he's the chap that takes very beautiful pictures of absolutely nothing," and I I really liked that. I liked the the sort of thought of that. Well, yes, um, there's a lot of negative space actually. You know, sometimes it's more it's more the negative space than that, that speaks than what's actually in the frame in the top right hand corner, for example, isn't it? Yeah, space has always been important to me, and um, uh, I don't know why. It is. Um, some people have said, uh, people that know me know that I'm terribly claustrophobic. I don't like to be, and I think this accounts, for, again, for my, my passion for the sea, which is obviously when you're out there and it's big, a big open thing, you can see the horizon. I'm very happy in that environment. I don't like to be, uh, for example, in a valley or in, you know, that sort of thing. I don't like to be in land too long. I like to be able to see the horizon. Um, mm. And that may be possibly one of the reasons I like space in my photographs. I don't know. I've never really analysed it that much but yeah space is important and in many ways to me it's more important than the thing that i'm shooting it's you know where it sits in the frame uh, is it, it has to have space it has to make me breathe i have to be able to breathe when i'm looking at it and feel mm. that the the thing can breathe too um that's really important the, the editor of black and white magazine elizabeth roberts described your work uh, admiringly and she added uh, and you can see the quote actually on your website uh, that it, its beauty is that it's unreliant upon its context. And I would agree. I, I don't know that the mane needs to belong to a pony in a Jonathan Critchley picture. Uh, I don't even need to know anything about a sale to, to understand the, the picture, I think. Do you think that's true? How, how long was the process of finding that star? Was it was it a, a long one? I don't think it's finished yet. I no? think it's, yes, it's long, and I think it's just ever, ever evolving. Um, um context yes i I, it's not like i'm a sort of reportage photographer where there needs to be a context of some sort there 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 doesn't with what i do and that's you know again going back to the pairs of images that uh, that you spoke about on the website uh that that kind of proves that theory that i can put a horse next to a sail and and they're unlinked in any way except for perhaps the, the 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 style of composition which i use so uh no i i I think context is something I don't really think about. I don't, I, for example, when I go to a country, I don't think I must take a photograph that looks like this country, mm. uh, that, that I, can, I can represent this country. I'm not interested really in that. All I'm still looking for is my way of presenting it. So I have photographs of some very beautiful places, but, uh, but you would never know that it would be Chile or China or mm. wherever. It's just, the, it's just the picture itself that, that is the important thing to me, just that one moment that I want to try and 
and capture and and it's it's like telling a story you know it's like it's telling a story that you've that you've made up about a place you've seen talking of stories that there is a wonderful story uh, which answers uh, well I th- there, there's various answers to why you shoot why, why the signature um shot for for you is is square crop um but the story that i, I adore is the one about the black and white television uh, that was in your <laughs> that was in your room and I, I i believe i had a television i, th- I think was similar aged and that i had a similar television in my room but that that's that's one of the reasons you give for for the square crop that's true when i was very small um i think my my father again must have passed me there's this very small black and white and it must have been 20 you know eight inches square yeah, something like that tiny. tiny little thing not even that smaller was it the um, one where you had to turn the the, the knob on the front to tune it yeah in? exactly yeah, exactly yeah, one of those yeah. uh, and uh and it was completely square and black and white and so uh yes i remember that vividly and those memories again of childhood very happy childhood and and connecting that with happiness i suppose maybe that's something but, but there are yes also the fact that when i started studying photography more seriously i was using hasselblad cameras which of course also you know, mm. square format which i really liked um so there's a number of reasons why that it might be but that one again i like the nostalgia behind that one so i'm going to stick with that one too I yeah think. i love that story has it, <laughs> has it caused any um issues with clients or magazines that have shown you work i mean I, I would imagine sometimes somebody would say jonathan but we we're trying to do a center spread here couldn't you just widen it out a little bit on this occasion yeah, it has. Um, and generally, uh, for example, magazine covers and things like that, it's even that is can be an issue because they want you know, a portrait rectangle. Yep, um, yeah. And I, I don't I don't do that. I don't supply that. So uh, on those uh, situations, I just say, well, you just crop it how you think and then just show me and then uh, then it'll work. We'll make it work. So, you know, you have to uh, I'm. I'm stubborn about my own work in that I, you know, the way it's presented as a print. I'm, I, I, want to, I want it to be a certain way. Hmm. But I fully understand uh, uh, that other people have jobs to do and sometimes the square doesn't fit, so they might have to make little alterations to make it work. I get that. The, the shots that you have from the very tops of sales, how, how do you achieve those? The, uh, are you rigging something? or? Yeah, I'd love to be able to tell you that I spent sort of you know hours climbing <laughs> up a, a, a rig. And, well, I want to you know, believe it, Jonathan. Gales. Yeah, I want to believe yeah. it. I t- well, you know, I get away with it, but the the the, the reality is that it's from a helicopter. I right, mean, that's right, it's yeah. um it's I don't use drones. O- often people say, you know, is that a drone shot? No, I, I'm not into that at all. Uh, it's not my thing. I mean, I fully understand why people are, but it's not my thing. Yeah. So no, it's, it's it's simply from um from a helicopter, and it's it's a great way to shoot. I'm, yeah. I generally spend about half an hour in the air at a, at a time, and it's it's amazing. It's kind of the the opposite of of um, of working from a boat you know it's, it's 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 there's no water there's no nothing and you're just hanging out of a helicopter with uh, with your feet um, on the on the runner and just leaning out and with a good pilot you can you can do a lot of work mm. in in half an hour it's it's, mm. a, it's a very uh, you know it's, an, it's certainly an adrenaline fueled way of shooting i want to change attack slightly actually uh, uh, attack is probably the correct word now you're, you're just just a, yeah. as home on on land photographing these beautiful images of of uh, of horses although i did see um in January, a, a pony just nudging you as you were chimping at the back of the camera. Um, probably, <laughs> no, maybe, I was thinking maybe the pony's trying to get on the course. I don't know. But this is another great passion of yours. And you keep horses and ponies at home, don't you? Yeah, horses, yeah. Um, so you mustn't say the word pony. Oh, uh, because the, the, right. the horse you're talking about was actually an Icelandic horse. Oh, uh, right. And, okay. uh, and if you mention correct. the word pony when you're in Iceland, right. they will immediately uh, evict <laughs> you from the country never to return. Right. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very uh, delicate I'll, thing. I'll take that solid advice for the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the horse, the horse sort of thing came up Really, I wouldn't say by accident, but it, it was linked to water in that uh, I had, uh, I don't know about you, uh, it's, it's an English phrase, I think. Well, I, I was um, on, I remember being a small boy of seven years old on the beach uh, with my mum and dad. Um, and I'm sure my sisters were there somewhere, but I, it was a rough day, winter, I guess. Mm. And uh, the waves were rolling in and there was this foam on top of the waves. So I said to one of my parents, what's that? And my dad, I think, said, oh, we call that the white horses. Oh, yeah. uh, and instantly, you know, and the, the imagination of a small boy turned these the foamy waves into these horses that were galloping in from the yeah. sea. And I even I remember dreaming about it that night, actually. And then many, many years later, I, I saw some, well, there was, this, there was a Guinness advert also in the UK in the That's 1990s. That's right, like, yes, yeah. Which basically, basically, sort of put a picture to the dreams that I'd had which which involved this wonderful black and white scenes of these horses coming in from the sea and um, uh, after I'd moved to France and was looking for things to shoot uh, I I saw a photograph of these horses in a part of France called the Camargue which is um, the, the, the delta of the Rhone River down on the south coast on the Mediterranean coast 
these horses of a breed of horses lived there for for, for, for centuries uh, and sure enough they live around the water and I'd seen some photographs of them running in the water and I thought wow that, that would be really fun to shoot and I was just getting a little bit um, you know stale with what I was shooting I wanted to try and introduce something else and keep pushing the boundaries a little bit and I, I knew I have to you know, I tell the truth I knew nothing about horses whatsoever I, I, I knew pretty much roughly what end was which. But apart from that, I didn't really know much about them. My wife, however, is uh, had, had grown up with horses, so she was able to help uh, me identify which were the right bits. And um, I arranged a few shoots down there in the Camargue and just loved them. The horses are, uh, are just wonderful. I just love that emotion of standing in front of these horses and, and watching them run, uh, gallop towards me through the water. And it became another passion. And, and then since then, um, yes, over over the years, we've now, we now have horses. My kids grew up right as well as swimming so that was nice yeah. for them and we still have horses now uh, and they have become a passion I've since gone on to photograph as I said the horses in Iceland and in the Netherlands uh, Frisian horses which are wonderful and elsewhere but uh, it's become something now it's, it's another sort of um, another, something else that I'm photographing that when I'm there I feel really uh, really free and uh, and really at home the images of uh, of the horses running running at you Quite in, well, no, not quite. They're very impressive. I mean, number one, I, I would assume you've you've got to be exceptionally patient to wait for that to happen. Um, number two, what's to stop them just running through you? Yeah, it, um, it, it is very exhilarating standing in front of in in the path of of galloping horses coming through water. The you know sitting on the ground as I am with my feet in the water, uh, you can feel it through you know through your bum. Wow, you you're sitting. You're, you're, you're sitting on the ground. You're not even standing. No, no, I have to. You, you have to sit on the ground because you want. You, know, you, you have otherwise. You have other things to deal with. And I just because I'm because I like the simple life. I don't want to. I, I like the, just to have the sky behind them, really, and a bit yeah, of water. So yeah. I get down very low. Sometimes lying down. And the horses. It's not luck. Uh, I, I would love to say that I would. You know, it would be the definitely the more um, exotic and uh, you know emotive answer would be that I'm, I've camped out for months waiting for these horses to come dashing through that lake at a certain time. But the reality is that um, they're, they're brought there uh, by uh, by other horse people. Uh, the the, the Kamarag has a um, very, very passionate about their horses. And the horses are really used like a very impressive four by fours. I mean, these people that have grown up on these horses, they, they literally, it's like they're joined to them uh, and they are unbelievable riders. And um, there's a there's a group of people called the Guardians, which are um, I guess you'd say Kamag cowboys uh, and girls, and they are the ones that, that, that sort of really love these horses, look after them, use the horses to round up bulls. I mean, they're really used as a as a as a tool, but very happy, very well fed, very well looked after, and live semi wild, so they're outside most of the time. And so I basically ask a few of these guardians to round up some horses and bring them towards me. So it's all done. I mean, it's it's wonderful exercise for the horses that I'm shooting. That they feel free and they're having a great time. And we never push them too hard. We normally shoot for about an hour and then that's it. And that's how that happens. So they're, they're basically brought to a location. Uh, and uh, and and when you see the horses, um, a photograph of the horses running at me, what you don't see is that either side of the, that group there are a couple of cowboys or girls, right. guardians, right. who are sort of running with them, just making sure they don't spread out too much uh, and keep them sort of more centralized it's you know horses when they're running at you uh the last thing in the world they want to do is to hit you uh, it right. would be sort of completely out of character for them they don't want to hurt you but also they don't want to hurt themselves more to the point they think well if it was a rock uh, that they're running at um the last thing they want to do is run at it and it's, they, they think the same about you or in, in this case me so the most important thing is that when they're running at you, that you don't move. You stay completely still uh, and, uh, and because they've already plotted the route. If I was to move uh, at the last minute because I started to worry, then they, the chances are they would hit me because they've already plotted where they're going to go. Mm. So you just have to hold your nerve. And as they come past, you just have to put your head down and, uh, and, uh, and your camera down, facing downwards, because the spray is quite enormous as they, as they come past I you. Bet, and that's yeah. it. And, but it's a wonderful thing to do. In a way, the fact that I don't know, I know horses a lot better now than I used to, but the fact that I, I, I'm, I'm not a trained horse person, I think probably has helped me in many ways. I'm not looking for... Um, I like the sort of aspect of them being a little bit wild and a bit savage and not looking too perfect. I think yeah. that's a part of what I do, yeah. 
The I, I, know, I know you you teach um, in your workshops. There, there is there, there are various uh, workshops you can go on to learn how to photograph horses. And that, that. But let's talk about your workshops more as a whole. It's become mm. a very important part of your business, isn't it? There's the fine art work, the client commissions, but but there are several wings really. And being a being a mentor, being a curator, being a being a being a trainer, they all sort of come together. But how, how important is the teaching to you? Yeah, I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I started. Um uh, I own a company called Ocean Capture, which has now been going for uh, almost 15 yeah, years. Yeah. And um, uh, it's when I started, it was, an, uh, you know, and I, I explained the situation when I started, I was looking for ways to earn money from photography, but not not dilute what I was doing. And of course, that seemed to me like the perfect way to, to do that in many ways. It was whilst I was building my reputation as a photographer to have workshops uh, to, to um to work with people to sort of show them what I was doing. I thought that might be an interesting thing. Uh, yeah, so it developed like that, developed organically. And uh, uh, for the first few years, it was just myself running a few workshops, mostly down in France and then going to different areas, uh, going Venice and then Iceland and other places. But then it just really, um, it just really went. Uh, it just, it just really developed very quickly. I, I think we we built up a very faithful client portfolio. Uh, p- people were really loving it and coming back, which is a huge, a huge, um, or compliment. And then I started because of the, because of the demand, I was then bringing in other photographers. Uh, and then I decided to, uh, it was getting to a point when I had to make a decision about it. And, um, what I realized that I just wanted something quality. And of course it's choices of hotels. Uh, it's that sort of thing. It's the, it's the service it's being offered. It's small groups. It's very uh, exclusive in many ways. But then I started bringing in photographers who were really, really at the top of their game who were willing to work with me and you know I've, we've I've run workshops with Michael Kenner and I've run mm. workshops with you know some really huge names mm. um Rachel Talibard is on is is one of our uh, you know main workshop uh, leaders and it's it's uh, Paul Sanders who I know you know yeah. another guy who uh, and uh, you know you working with those names and, and associating ocean capture with them and then with ocean capture it's become a whole different thing and I'm really really proud of the way it's developed and you know that's that's a lovely place to be to, to bring yeah. out someone's creativity is is a wonderful or, or to try to and, and and hopefully and luckily succeed uh, quite a lot is is a wonderful thing to do and uh, really enjoy that journey um like like you my my father uh, passed um really uh, quite young and um he never got to see he never got to see my, my photographic journey um I wonder what your dad would make of this, because, of course, one of the reasons you said you picked up a camera and looked out to sea and spent those times, you know, looking out on your own was was that it gave you time to think. Have you ever thought about what your your father, because, of course, the camera was uh, was his, wasn't it, when you started, what, what he would yeah. what he would probably make of all this and your success? Yes, I, I have thought about it, and when I often at sort of when I go back to the UK when I was allowed to, uh, and we would sort of sit in a, in a, a family situation, it was often brought up. Um, not only was he a sort of fairly frustrated artist, I think he was a businessman and a very successful one, but I think like many people in that situation, he it was less about creativity and uh, and, and in arts, it was more about creativity in business. So mm. that's the first thing. I think he would have loved what I do. But the second thing was he was an enormous francophile. He used to love France uh, and used to come down at any excuse come down to the Mediterranean coast um, and so I think uh, those two the fact that I've sort of followed those two um, uh, journeys I think he will be delighted so I like to think that he would be uh, yeah smiling right now my thanks to Jonathan Critchley tomorrow the shorter snapshot edition for a Tuesday introduces a photographer you'll be hearing far more of soon one of the plans for the new snapshot shows is to share photographers' stories about how they made a particularly important picture or set of pictures in a story. And tomorrow, political photographer Stefan Russo from PA Media shares an account of the day he found himself photographing British Parliament's most feared type of modern attack. So I'd broken all the rules by taking these pictures on parliamentary grounds. And I said to the, the office, I said, look, I've got all these pictures, you know, I've broken all the rules, but I'm prepared to risk it because I'll probably lose my pass, but we can't not put these pictures out. Be sure to visit photographydaily.show for links today on what you've heard. And if you can help share the show, those podcast player reviews are so helpful, as are any and all shares that you make in social media like Twitter and Facebook and so on. Music in the show was from artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you tomorrow. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.